All right, guys, we figured out, I think, the problem and um, going to help him get on now in just a minute. I deeply apologize for that. Um, hey, Joe, we had a little technical difficulty. I think we figured it out. He's going to join on a different device that he was using. Um, but, you know, the enemy does not want us to be informed voters, now does he? He wants us to be uninformed, uneducated voters, and so of course he's going to get in the way of all of this. Um, so for those of you who I'm guessing a lot of you are here from the 11th district, um, welcome, welcome to everybody. Uh, Mark is gonna hop on a different device that should help um, him join a lot easier. And um, you can submit your questions down below here where the question mark is. Thanks Joe for the encouragement, you know I was nervous. Um, you from there, I know a lot of you submitted questions, um, and these, are, that's just some of them, I'm gonna hold like two pages full of questions. We'll get through as many as possible. We'll have to end at about 8.40. Um, as I was mentioning before, I also get to do another live with a young woman who is leading uh, the pro-life movement here in Illinois, and I am super impressed with her, Savannah. So, um, we're just waiting for Mark, hopefully, to hop on here. Um, otherwise, in the meantime, I might just have someone else hop on if we uh, if we can. Um, might have to reschedule, which is disappointing, I'm sure, for everyone. Um, let's see if I can find him. Thanks guys, super appreciate your encouragement. So why is the 11th district important um, when it comes to, you know, why is it getting all this attention? Well, one of the reasons is because right now it's held by a Democrat, it's a, it's a blue seat. Um, and it's one of at least three con US congressional seats uh, that is believed can easily be turned, not easily, but, um, has a good chance to turn to a red seat. Um, there's Mark right there. Let's see if we can get him on. Uh, if you can request Mark, that'd be great. And so this race is really important. There's seven Republican candidates in the primary. Uh, so that's also another reason uh, that it is important because you know, you've got a lot of choices, guys. And um, you know, gotta make yourself a educated, an educated voter. Uh, says he's unable to join. Let's see. Let's see, here we go. All right. Is this gonna work? Come on. I have never had a problem with this. I cannot believe this is work, not working. Although Instagram does hate me, so there's that. Everybody pray that this works well because, again, this has never happened and I do lives almost every day. Never had an issue whatsoever. Um, Chrissy from Illinois Patriots is on here. She's amazing. So, yes, by the way, there's another Chrissy who is an awesome grassroots leader. And <laughs> people get us confused, but we are two different people, believe it or not. She runs Illinois Patriots and I run Freedom Illinois. So, uh, but we work together a lot. Actually, we have some things hopefully coming up soon. All right, it says you're unable to join. Mark, can you request again? I do not know what is going on here. This is very frustrating and kind of embarrassing, I'm not gonna lie. Um, if we need to, we will hop over to Facebook um, and do it that way. And I'm sorry to say that it might have to happen, guys, because Instagram is uh, being a jerk. We'll give it one more try, and then we'll switch over to Facebook. <gasps> Wait a second, got we got it, it. we got it. There we go. Can you uh, see me, I, hear me? I can see your computer. <laughs> oh. Um, how's that? Uh, Hold on, let me yet. switch. You're gonna there. have to push the, there you go. <laughs> You're gonna wanna go vertical. You wanna go vertical. Okay. You see yourself? Yes. Okay. Sorry. 
I'm I am so sorry. Today, so uh, thank you for pushing through. <laughs> really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank um, you. I thank you for your patience and all of your viewers. I, I didn't mean to, I know your time is precious, so. Oh, no, we understand. The technical difficulties, you know, like I tell them, Instagram hates me, so I am not totally surprised by this at all. But we'll just hop into it right away and, <laughs> you know, get the questions when we can. And then if we have to, I guess we another time we'll have to, to finish off. I mean, we've got a lot of really great questions for you. Um, so why don't you start off and just tell us a little bit about yourself and why, briefly, why you decided to run for U.S. Congress. Sure. Thank, uh, first off, thanks uh, again for having me on. Uh, uh, you know, I'm the youngest of nine kids. I was born and raised in Illinois. I've lived in Illinois um, almost my entire life, other than when I went away to college and I spent a short time in Washington. Um, and my wife and I live in North Aurora with our three kids and I've been involved. We've been involved in our church, our school. I've been a coach. We've been involved in our community for our entire marriage. Uh, we've been married for 20 years. Um, and I've always felt called to politics since I was like in fifth grade and I was watching the Iran Contra hearings with my dad. Um, and, uh, uh, I, until recently, I've been involved in local politics, and I've been content to be involved, very heavily involved in our community. Um, but I, I just couldn't sit back anymore with what's happened in the last two years, especially um, with the power that has just been taken away from us as citizens, as people, as parents. Um, and, and I, I just have to be an example to my three sons that there are some times when we sacrifice family time and, and coaching and stuff like that because there's a greater good that we need to serve. And this is one of those times for me. Wow. And can you just briefly discuss, you said, you know, in local politics, you were hyper involved, you know, at a hyper local level. Can you um, share briefly like what that what that role has been? Sure. Uh, we've lived in North Aurora since uh, 2003, I believe. And uh, right away, I got involved in the North Aurora Lions Club. I, I was had a young law practice and I was trying to meet people in the community. And uh, I a lot of the local politicians were involved in the uh, Lions Club. So uh, the mayor then was uh, Dale Berman and asked me if I wanted to get involved with the planning commission, and I did. And I got in, uh, appointed to the planning commission, served there for five years, um, and then a seat opened up on the board when one of our uh, trustees got appointed as the fire chief, and I was appointed as a trustee, and then I'm currently in my serving my second term as a village trustee in the village of North Aurora. Awesome. Thank you so much for giving us that background. There's, you know, on, on Freedom Illinois, there's a lot of people that have joined you know, my page because a lot of them have never, a lot of us have never been involved in politics before. And with everything that's happened over these last two years, um, a lot of people, especially on here, have found themselves in a place of, I now need to be involved. I should have been, but I need to be. And so we definitely wanted to give them a background on who the candidates are before we just jump into these, what your opinion is and your stances on things and so people can get to know you. Um, Okay, so let's then talk about, um, you know, I, I know you have uh, also a prior involvement as a staffer in Congress. Um, how have you been um, party to the drafting or legislation? Who did you work with? Uh, yeah, thanks. I, I graduated from Hillsdale College uh, back in 1996. At the end of my junior year, I was uh, honored to have been chosen for an internship program in Washington. Um, I served as an intern right in Memorial Day, beginning Memorial Day of 95, which was right after the Republicans took over for the first time in, I think, 20 years with Newt Gingrich and the Republican Revolution. Uh, chairman Hyde was the chairman, Henry Hyde, of the House Judiciary Committee. So I worked at the subcommittee on the Constitution, which was a subcommittee of Chairman Hyde's. 
I got to work on the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act uh, the first time it was passed, um, and uh, the Defense of Marriage Act, parental rights legislation, euthanasia, and it amazes me that 25 years later, we're still talking about the same issues. Wow. Mm. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, okay, so in the 11th District U.S. Congressional Primary, there are seven Republicans. Six there. now. Uh, One withdrew, I believe. I thought it was uh, one. Juan Ramos. From, oh, my understanding, there was eight and one withdrew, but maybe I, I'm wrong. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of you in the Republican <laughs> primary um, in, in a very, very important race is nationally. As we've talked, you know, we've been talking about this is I all eyes are on this race among, you know, there's at least two other districts congressionally. Right. Um, so I think it's important to hear from you. Why you? Why should we choose you? What separates you from the other candidates and makes you the best choice for the 11th district people? First off, I want to say that I commend anybody that's willing to do this because um, it, it, it's a huge sacrifice to my family. I have to give a shout out to my wife because I couldn't do this without her because as a coach, being involved in our community, all of that stopped and my wife had to pick up the slack. So um, there are, uh, I think there were eight initially, one did not file and then one has since withdrawn. But they're all good candidates, and, and I have to commend every single one of them for for working. But what separates me, I believe, is my education and experience. I believe in this as an extended job interview, um, and I think my background at Hillsdale in constitutional law, my practice of law for 20 years where I've sat with uh, small business owners, and help them navigate the, the economic downturn of 2007, 2008. I, I help them solve problems to get them through that. I've sat with senior citizens as they put together estate plans and they plan for end of life decisions. What happens when, you know, my spouse dies, what's gonna happen to me? I've sat with those people and help them uh, navigate some of the toughest issues that they'll ever face in their life. And I, I prided myself in as a litigator and as an attorney, as a problem solver. Um, and I think it's one thing to go to Washington and check up, check off all the Republican boxes. You know, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-Second Amendment, I believe in limited government. But it's another thing to actually understand how important that limited government actually is. Because what we've seen over the last... <laughs> 30 or 40 years is this chipping away of the protections and the checks and balances and, and the things that protect us while we're in the minority. And if we don't do something now uh, to, to reinstate those checks and balances, uh, we're going to have, we're not going to recognize what our Republic looks like five years from now, 10 years from now, or 50 years from now. So I believe I, can identify those, those areas. And I think I have the experience as a problem solver to be able to work in an adversarial setting and solve problems for the people of the 11th district. Thank you. Okay, so speaking of the other candidates, um, as I imagine you already saw, journalist <laughs> has pointed out that an event listing on your campaign website, you appear to take shots at one Possibly two primary opponents, including uh, referring to uh, a pretty face is great, but and being unapologetic. Uh, were you taking shots at your opponents? And if so, why'd you start off that way? I'm not taking shots. We're, uh, you know, having a little bit of fun, but we're also, um, this is a serious job. And it's a serious campaign for a serious job. I see America as we're at a tipping point right now. Mm -hmm. And if we don't uh, elect serious candidates that are willing to rip that power out of Washington and bring it back to the state and local level, then we're going to continue with the status quo. Every time, every two years, we're going to wait for the next reelection. We keep uh, electing, sending people to Congress that care more about serving themselves than about serving the people of the 11th district. 
And the best way to serve the people of the 11th district is get the power out of Washington and bring it back locally. And having sat on local, uh, in a local village, that's where you can have the greatest impact. And the people of the 11th district will have the loudest voices at those local school districts, the local elections. That's where your voices can be heard. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, okay, so if you win the Republican primary, June 28th, everyone get out there, vote early on the first day, by the way. Early voting, get out there and vote. Uh, I always have to mention that. Um, claim your votes. If you don't vote, I promise you that they're going to use your vote for you. Um, okay, anyway, so the 28th, you'll be facing the seven-turn Congressman Bill Foster in the fall, if you win, okay? So, I mean, that means you've had time to get to know him. It, it, it's been a long time he's, he's been the incumbent. Uh, can you point out three specific votes of Foster's over the years? And where have your, most of your differences been with him? And how, how are you going to do the job differently uh, that, than Foster's done? Well, uh, you know, it's funny you say that. Because as I've gone around the district and I've asked people if they know who Bill, most people don't know who Bill Foster is because he's not done anything spectacular for this district. You know why? Because he votes party line all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think um, what I didn't see from Bill Foster is Joe Biden in the last year broke the law two times. He, he started an eviction moratorium when he knew that a sitting Supreme Court justice said it would be unconstitutional without legislative action. But he knew he only needed 30 days to get it passed to what he needed to do. So what did he do? He institutes the eviction moratorium, slow rolls it through the courts, knowing it's going to be struck down. But, but he did it knowing it was going to be struck down. So we have a commander in chief that broke the law just to, to get his agenda passed. And there was crickets from Bill Foster and the rest of the Democrats to call him out. Instead, they were encouraging to use the power of the executive branch more forcefully. They want to cancel student loan debt. They want to do all these things by executive order. And the legislature sits idly by and watches what I would do differently is I believe in bipartisanship. I believe in legislation. And, and, and if we have to, we will go it alone. But unfortunately, we're going to have a Democratic president for the next two years when, uh, unless we have a veto-proof majority, we're going to have to learn how to bring Bill, uh, Joe Biden back to the middle and away from the extreme uh, left that he's sat on for the last two years. Yeah, now you, you mentioned you mentioned Joe Biden, so, um, <laughs> you know, I'm going to ask a question that actually came up quite a bit. Do you believe our elections are free and fair? Um, you know, you know what? That's a great question. I, I, I think that uh, the Constitution is really clear on, on what defines a free and fair election. And, and our elections are set forth by our state legislatures, period. And, and in the last election, what we saw across the country were secretary of states, election boards and judges that changed the law in the middle of the game. Um, I'm a firm believer that I believe in the office of the presidency. Um, so I, I believe in the office of the presidency, so I'll respect that. But I want to move forward so that our elections, what happened in 2020, never happen again. We need clearly defined uh, legislation that says that, or, or, well, actually, we need a Supreme Court that will uphold the Constitution. And when uh, Secretary of States and other elected officials that aren't accountable and aren't authorized under the U.S. Constitution try to change the election laws, we need to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. and, and that just goes to show how important local elections are. Uh, for example, in Illinois, we elect our um, local municipal people in February or March of uh, off election years. Why is that? 
you think that they do that on purpose? I ran in, in uh, North Aurora and I won in a town of 20,000 people with like 400 votes. It's because they intentionally don't want people to come out to the polls. Mm-hmm. And, and we built this system to keep people in power and, and to take power away from the people. And what I believe is that we need to get back to a the understanding of the Constitution that our rights don't come from the benevolence of politicians or they're not articulated in the Constitution. Our rights come from God. And anything that uh, is in the Constitution is limiting our rights in order to live together in a free society. But that doesn't mean those are only the rights that we have. So I believe we need to get back to a a clearer understanding of the U.S. Constitution and what that means for the nature and scope of our federal government. Wonderful. Um, You know, speaking of rights, something that has come up repeatedly in conversations with people here on Freedom Illinois is parental rights. Um, And we've seen we've seen that trampled upon, tread upon um, a lot lately. Um, what what are you going to do um, at a federal level to protect parental rights? Well, the best way to protect uh, parental rights is, uh, number one, to reduce the size and scope of the federal government. The, the parents are not going to get their voices heard at the national level. They, their voices are going to be heard the, the loudest at the state and local level. That's what we've seen here in the 11th district and throughout Illinois in the last two years, this grassroots uprising of parents that are fed up with politicians that ignore them. And so one of the things is we need to really take a serious hard look at the Department of Education and the uh, the federal, the U.S. Department of Education, and some of the indoctrination, the uniform standards that they're imposing on our school districts We have to look at, if we have to, constitutional amendments defining when life begins, what uh, gender (laughs) means. Um, And and, and we need to take the steps necessary to protect our families, our, our protect life, protect our children as much as possible at the federal level. But I'm also, I also believe in limited government. So, but, but there are core universal truths that our federal government can protect. Yeah. Um, so speaking of, of that, right, the parents in the movement, we've seen people get involved in the last two years that have never been involved. We've already mentioned this. Uh, what are things that you've done these last two years, both, I mean, both as an elected official and as a citizen? How have you helped fight back? Um, well, here, I, I have uh, spent the better part of two years in, in lockdown, but I, I went to work every day. I, I left my house, went to work every day. And unfortunately, I I hope we didn't lose him. There we go. Here. He's a compliance director and a general counsel. So my job was to monitor all of the ridiculous mask mandates across the country. So I was bombarded every day with what people, you know, the the different science that, but what I did is I tried to keep my kids from getting scared um, because we, we had to turn off the TV because all you heard were the numbers and that if you got COVID, you were going to die. And if you didn't wear a mask, you didn't. Um, I, I did not go out and protest. I went to village board meetings and we tried to help our restaurant survive by creating uh, outdoor patio situations where they could, uh, um, we, we forgave any sort of um, liquor fees and, and permit licenses. We did our best to keep our restaurants and bars open. We followed the uh, the state when they allowed liquor sales, uh, drive through liquor sales. Uh, North Aurora followed all that. Um, but the most egregious thing that happened in Illinois was we were completely deprived of procedural due process for two years 
by our governor and the legislature um, was completely deprived of its responsibility to legislate. If and, and here we live in the bluest of blue states. If the science was so solid, why wouldn't Governor Pritzker hold hearings and have the legislate send it to the legislature to ratify his emergency orders? Because we live in a state where the Supreme their state Supreme Court's going to uphold it, the legislature's going to pass it, and the governor and that legitimizes the process at least. I'm not at all advocating for mask mandates or vaccines, but I do believe in process, procedural due process, and we're completely deprived of that for two years. Amen. Um, and so, I mean, I, and on a personal level, I mean, where, like, with your children and stuff like that, how did that affect them at school? What did you do to fight back at their schools? Uh, well, here, uh, my both my kids or all three of my kids uh, go to two separate private schools and they, and they have um, for a while. And uh, my wife and I made a commitment to send our kids to parochial uh, Lutheran schools from preschool on. Um, and so they were in school the whole time um, other than that original spring uh, date. But uh, we were, blessed to be able to send our kids to school full time. They had to wear masks. Um, but here, I, I, I'm a believer that the Lutheran, the, the Lutheran schools, the Catholic schools, they were in an unwinnable situation because um, they had to follow their diocese or their synod or especially the bigger, the bigger schools uh, or bigger churches. Um, and, and they didn't want to lose their accreditation. You know, one little, although I saw your your uh, uh, interview a couple of weeks ago, or was it oh, last month? Yeah, he found yeah. that. And, and, and thank God they did. And and they had a congregation that was willing to do that. Um, unfortunately, we did not. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, let's, um, we have some, some, you know, pretty basic questions that are really going to come up when it, when, when it comes to the U.S., Congress. Um, so I'd love to first hear, in your opinion, what is the number one crisis facing America today? Um, I believe the number one crisis uh, would be our securing the border. I, I mean, that, that that's by far the number one crisis. I believe the biggest threat to our uh, republic is the erosion of the checks and balances that I talked a little bit about, because I, I, I'm I'm very, very concerned that if we don't, as when the Republicans win the majority, it's not just about governing and putting out fires now. It's about governing so that this never happens again. And we've seen from history that the Republicans are the only party that talks about limited government. They're the only party that talks about the Constitution, because when the Democrats got in power and they won the slimmest majority in the Senate that could possibly, what did they do? They want to end the filibuster. They want to add two states that are Democrat leaning states for since Lyndon Johnson. They in the great society, the Democrats have taken the position that if we can't win in legislatively, we're going to use the courts to pass our radical agenda. And guess what? When we finally have a president that puts conservatives on the court and they realize they can't do that anymore, what do they do? They're going to threaten to pack the courts. They're going to attack the Electoral College. Those checks and balances, all of those are are hugely important for protecting us when we're in the minority. And, and the Democrats don't understand that because their uh, mantra is the end justifies the means. Even if you listen to their argument during COVID, it was never, did I have the authority to act the way I did? It was always, well, people are dying and you're a, a terrible human being if you disagree with me. Um, instead of well, do I really have the authority to institute a mask mandate? Why do you think we never had a mask mandate uh, instituted federally? Biden, to give him his due, understood that they didn't have the constitutional authority to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they would have tried. 
had the Supreme Court been differently, I, 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 I can almost guarantee that. Yeah, and I mean, and I hear you on the checks and balances, but right now the Dems, I mean, they have they have the media behind them, everything behind them. They have, you know, the majority. What? How, how are you going to bring attention to to the? I mean, you mentioned the border. It was my next question. Once elected, what are you going to do about the southern border? How are you going to make a splash in that at this point when when everyone's being so silenced? What are you going to do? Well, first off, uh, I think the Republicans are going to win and they're going to win big. So there are going to be like minded people. The difference, though, I think, is with regard to the southern border. If we institute or if we administrate by executive order, similar to what we've done for the last six, eight years or going back to Obama. And I mean, we've done more executive orders each presidency. The problem is that once that president's out of office, as we've seen, all of that activity is undone. So that's what Biden has spent two years undoing all of the, the benefits that Trump made on the southern border. We need to get to a point where the legislature works again, where Congress works again, and we can uh, legislate some immigration reform that is permanent, that addresses, puts boots on the ground, builds a wall, and uses drone technology uh, where we can't build a wall so that there are no leaks and, and that our southern border is secure and we can sleep confidently that um, that we have a country again. And, and I think you have to have a secure southern border but there, there are um, that has to be done legislatively so that the next blue wave that comes it makes it that much harder to undo that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's move on to the, another crisis, uh, the current oil crisis, right? We, we, right. But this one really bit us in the butt, huh? Um, right. So once you're once you're elected, you know, what are you going to do? What is your stance on the Keystone Pipeline, and what what's your plan? What what's, what are you going to do when you're there? Well, my hope would be that the Republicans would in in institute legislation or initiate legislation right away that would reinstate the licenses for the Keystone Pipeline. But we have to get Biden to sign. Um, and uh, hopefully there's a maybe there we get such a majority that we can override a veto or maybe we can pull some Democrats that understand that four dollar and fifty gas stations in McHenry County are not acceptable. Uh, or uh, so I, I'm all for drilling. You, you can't shut off the pump at home and, and push a radical Green New Deal agenda that doesn't have the infrastructure set up for 50 years um, because you want to drive your agenda. The, the problem with the current administration is they're driving an agenda that's not market driven. Our market is not ready for green energy, and it won't be for 50 years. So you can't just cut off the spigot. Um, uh, and, uh, I mean, what about drilling in government-owned land? Are you, how do you feel about that? I, I, I'm, here, we need to be energy independent. Uh, and, and if we have oil reserves on federal land, we need to uh, tap into those oil reserves. We need to make full use of our resources here in America to provide for Americans. Um, and uh, I, I think the, the idea that somehow uh, us buying oil from Venezuela or, or going uh, – <laughs> You know, we're going to they I, I did see that Fa, or Bill Foster, he voted to uh, restrict Russian imports. Yay. Way to go. So all you did was make it uh, a little bit more expensive. But 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 be good. Be happy because uh, Cook County, they're going to give us away gas cards and Governor Pritzker is going to give us one hundred dollars per kid to buy our vote. Uh, don't buy it. Don't fall for it, uh, because until we. Um, we win the majority and Republicans win back the House and Senate. And at the local level, I, I cannot stress this. It's not Congress doesn't get elected in a vacuum. It all works together. Our local government, we have to have people that understand that local government drives America's economy. We got to get the federal government out of the way so that 
we can unleash job growth, wage growth, uh, technology, innovation. None of that can be done when all of the power is is held in the hands of the federal government. Yeah, and, and that's not even talking about the fourth branch of government that just chokes out over regulation and chokes out business ingenuity. And, and uh, so you didn't ask me that, but that's a topic for a different discussion. Yeah, well, you know, there's a follow up question right here from um, a follower, Local Liberty Dad. What about privatizing Bureau of Land Management um, land in Alaska and the Western U.S. to free resources? Um. I'd have to look more into that, um, but uh, uh, you know, I, I believe that the market, market-driven economy, has served America well for 250 years, and uh, we've gotten uh, in debt, in great debt. We rob uh, from our children's future in the last 50 years, 60, 70 years. Um, guess what? Our, our government's gotten tripled in size. Our debts quadrupled. Um, and, and it's all because of government control. Like Ronald Reagan said, uh, the worst things you can hear is I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, you, you, you talked about money, right? So and this inflation is, is absurd. Right. You know, at, at a congressional level, how, how are you going to handle the, inf the inflation crisis, the inflation issue? Well, I think... Um, one of the things I witnessed when I was in Washington was uh, the Republicans pushed President Clinton into a balanced budget. And in the late 90s, they uh, had a balanced budget for, for seven years. And uh, going into 9-11, uh, we had a surplus. Um, uh, and I, I think we need to get back to uh, having – uh, legislation where we actually pass all 13 appropriations bills on time in, in time, like by September 30th, instead of these ridiculous continuing resolutions where Congress always uh, acts like our hair is on fire and uh, we have to raise the debt ceiling. We have to pass these continuing resolutions or we're going to threaten to shut down the government. So I, I think we need to get to a point where we, um, we govern again. Uh, the, the legislature has to do its job. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just, I, I'm a big proponent of term limits. For one of the first things that I think the Republicans should do is they should propose a constitutional limit okay. or a constitutional amendment requiring term limits. All right. Okay, well, let's move on to um, 2A. It's something that's you know, people are asking, a lot of the voters, a lot of uh, followers here ask, if they want to know uh, your stance on 2A and how you plan to protect the Second Amendment in Washington. Well, here, the Second Amendment is, is just that. There, I mean, the founders understood the importance of the Second Amendment. They put it right after free speech and uh, free press uh, and freedom of, to worship. So uh, the founders found that the Second Amendment was pretty important in ID2. And, and, and I don't believe that there's anything in the Second Amendment, and I've read it, and I'm being a little bit facetious, that says that the Second Amendment only applies to hunters and sportsmen. It applies to everybody. It, it's, a, it's our right to self-defense. Um, and uh, it, it, if you look at the context and history of when the Second Amendment was written, it was because British soldiers were being housed at people's houses to prevent the American Revolution, uh, or actually after the American Revolution, when it, to prevent that from ever happening happening again. But the founders understood the importance of the Second Amendment. Okay, so just a feedback question. I'm curious about your opinion on the Foyd card in Illinois. Then, just quick opinion. I, I think the Foyd needs to be voided. I, I, there's no reason to have a Foyd card. Uh, um, or concealed carry card. So constitutional carry. Yeah, I mean it's a constitution. The constitution says the right to bear arms shall not be abridged. That that's the, about the most unequivocal part in the constitution that we have is the Second Amendment. But yet it's the one that is challenged the most. Yeah, I mean it's pretty clear, isn't it? 
Um, what is your stance on the overwhelming lack of support for law enforcement in both local and federal governments? Uh, how will you combat this? And can you share your opinion on uh, Illinois House Bill 3653? Um, I, I, I think the, uh, the fund, the police movement is very dangerous. Um, uh, we rely on our law enforcement, uh, officers that are there, there are foot soldiers on the street to uphold the rule of law every single day. And those people, uh, uh law, uh, law enforcement, not only locally, the sheriffs, the, the state troopers, they put their lives on the line every time they pull somebody over. Um, and I think it's disgusting that we, we highlight these highlight reels, uh, you know, it, but they don't show or tell the numbers of how many traffic stops, uh, uh, police pull over that are, uh, dangerous to the officers every single day. Um, so in Illinois, I, I think it's um, the House bill that was passed in the middle of the night that uh, takes away tort, tort immunity and, and uh, qualified immunity for officers. I think it's it's disgraceful that that's how we re re reward the people that are sworn to protect us. Um, we're actually going to head kind of backtrack about something pretty local. Um, uh, this came up actually a couple times in the questions in different ways. So I'm going to try to word it in the best way I can, combining everything. Um, after the Republican primary, will you commit to immediately support the entire Republican ticket, including nominee, you know, the nominee for the 11th um, primary, if they decide to nominate someone other than you? Uh, absolutely. I think, as I started out saying, or I, I believe that um, the candidates in this race are, are, are good people and they will serve the District uh, 11 well. So absolutely, I would, serve, I would support whoever wins the nomination. Uh, I, I hope it's me. I, I think, like I said, I think if this like a job interview, I've hired people um, I, I've, and I think I, I'm the best prepared, not only for the job, but also to stand toe to toe with Bill Foster and hold him accountable for his record. Um, okay, and what about the other Republicans on the ticket? Uh, absolutely, I will support the ticket. Okay, so the follow up to that is, is um, a race for King County Board in District 2 will have a fall matchup between incumbent Democrat Dale Burnham, which we were appointed by, um, and Republican challenger Bob McQuillan are both running unopposed in their respective primaries. In spite of your serving with Berman when he was village president of North Aurora, who appointed you to the village board in 2014, will you be openly endorsing and supporting the Republican nominee over Berman? Or, um, I mean, noting you live in King County, but... Um, I, I would endorse the Republican candidate uh, and, and unequivocally. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, I know that's important to the, to our, to the voters um, as they are seeing division. Um, okay, so I actually have a couple other questions coming in live that I want to get to before we... Um, so th this one, another local Liberty Dad one. As a citizen, I don't have qualified immunity if I kill someone in my line of work. Why do officers get off, get off the hook with qualified immunity? Um, because we are putting them intentionally in the line of danger. Um, it, it, we are asking them to, uh, to represent the people of the state of Illinois or the people of the village of North Aurora or the people of Kane County or McHenry County every single day. Every time they put that badge on, they represent the state and the people. And we give the, every state actor qualified immunity while they're working under the, their employment in the course of their employment. Police officers should be no different. All right, thank you. Uh, okay, if you had a magic button to eliminate any or all federal agencies, which agency agencies would you eliminate? <laughs> well, uh, there's a couple. But the first would be uh, the Department of Education, um, because I don't think there's any 
um, authority in the Constitution given to educate our children. If you actually read the Constitution, uh, it doesn't say the word educate or education anywhere in the uh, Constitution. The second, uh, you know, I, I don't know, there's a lot of over, I, I'm in the financial services industry and we're overseen by the CFPB. Uh, the CFPB uh, is the big bad wolf and and, uh, and there's very little accountability to the people for any of these executive agencies um, and they have full power. All three branches of government have worked in concert to uphold these branches all with the aim to shirk responsibility and accountability so that the people can just keep getting reelected. That's the whole point of the fourth branch of government. Uh, someone just put in a question right now. What is your stance on medical freedom? It's kind of an open-ended question. So I guess I guess I would add to it. Um, where do you believe you know medical freedom stands at this point, and what are you going to do to protect that? Here, I believe that um, the government has no business um, telling us what to put in our body or on our body. Um, at, at the federal level. At the state level, I think that um, it, it's very, very important to elect. Uh, I mean, we need to win back the House and the Senate in the state of Illinois, or at the very least, the Supreme Court, so that uh, when legislatures try to, or legislators try to pass crazy uh, medical legislation, or the governor tries to do an executive order, at least the Supreme Court can strike that down and protect the people. Yeah. Okay. What legislative action will you introduce or support to limit or deconstruct the power of the federal government? Well, you know, I, I don't think a lot of people know this, but one of the first things that Newt Gingrich did when they won in 1994 is he reduced the size of the congressional staff by a third, a third. Um, and they didn't get hired back. And now by now, I'm sure they probably have. That's something that Congress can do immediately upon winning the majority. That saves huge amounts of money. Um, and they can do that without the president's consent. Um, but I, I would think that um, we need to start legislating again. Um, and stop allowing President Biden to uh, administrate. We, instead of legislating, we're administrating. Our, our chief executives are running the country by executive orders that they're the only ones making the decision. I mean, think about that at the state level. Over the last two years, there have been, what, four governors that have, that have basically imprisoned 100 million people under mandates, uh, New York, Michigan, Illinois, and California. I mean, think about that. The, the amount of power that they had that was unfettered and unchallenged in those super blue states. Um, and at the, we need to put in, that's why I believe in the procedural due process, to prevent that from ever happening again. You know, I... I... I am a big fan of like Madison Cawthorn and, and Representative Green. Um, as as I, I often feel in Illinois, we don't have really anyone representative. Barry Miller is incredible. I'm super grateful for her. Can we count on you at, uh, to ruffle feathers once you get there? Um, Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, I, I, I do believe, though, that Solving problems moves America forward. Um, and, and ruffling feathers, while it's good and it, it's good on media, if it doesn't amount, if it doesn't result in, in change, then it, then it then it's useless. So uh, I, I can tell you, um, my demeanor is not. I'm not going to jump up and down. And, and in 20 years of litigation, I have always experienced those attorneys that will thump their chest, they jump up and down. And you know what? That's never won the day. What wins the day are facts, uh, logic, and, and winning people to your side. So that here, we need to legislate 
we need to move the needle. We need to move the needle on immigration. We need to move the net needle on education. We meet, need to move the needle on crime, on uh, inflation. And just standing up and screaming at the rooftop mm -hmm. does nothing to help the people of the 11th district. We need somebody that actually knows how to work in an adversarial system and draw people to the, here, I believe in the Republican platform because it's the right platform, because it's it represents America's values. We are not a far left country and we're not a far right country. We are a middle right country. And uh, and but the problem is we've been uh, all we hear are the extremes. And, and there are good people on both sides of the aisle that want what's good for their kids. They want what's good for their families. They don't want to have to worry about tampon uh, machines in their boys' bathroom or critical race theory in their school when they're, or listening about sex education when they're in third grade. All of those things are completely ridiculous because they, they border on the fringes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, I think that those are you hit on some important issues that the voters care about for sure. Okay, so we have uh, two and a half questions left. Uh, well, <laughs> there's several. We have time for two and a half. Um, can you tell me what is the legitimate function of the federal government? Uh, well, uh, the common defense and the general welfare. And, and, and the here. I believe there's a critical misunderstanding between what Democrats in Washington and even some in our own party believe uh, of the role and function of the Constitution and the scope and nature of the federal government. Uh, like I said before, I believe in the Constitution as a social compact. Our rights are derived by God. And in order to live in unity with each other, we give up certain rights and we authorize the enumerate through enumerated powers to the federal government. But I, I just want to point out something. Everybody talks about the first, second, third, fourth, fifth amendments. I, I challenge your viewers to look at the ninth and tenth amendment. The ninth amendment talks about whatever is not enumerated to the federal government is reserved to the states. And the tenth amendment says that whatever rights are are, are reserved to the people. So the, the constitution doesn't define our rights. Our rights are defined by God. The Constitution limits our rights so we can live together, but that doesn't mean that those are the only rights out there. They didn't put, our founders didn't put a right to privacy in the Constitution because they knew it was so embedded in our understanding. That's what prevents us from getting a needle stuck in our arm or having somebody tell us we have to wear a mask is our inherent God-given rights to privacy. And people will say, well, what about Roe versus Wade? The problem is the Roe versus Wade wasn't about the right to privacy. It was about protecting life. And, and, and that's why Roe versus Wade was wrongly decided, because the court did not uphold our most basic uh, right that was in the first line of the declaration. Uh, you know, we're, we're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. And among them, the right to life liberty and pursuit of happiness. Our constitution embodies that. And, and it, protects, uh, it protects us from overreaching power of the government. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I could go on for a long time, I'm sorry. No, I, I think it's fantastic and you're hitting on, you actually hit on some points I didn't have time to ask you about, which I appreciate. Um, so I can I follow up with this one. It's a double. It's a double-sided question, and then we will. I'll let you just kind of finish off with anything after that that you want to add. Um, so I, I believe Illinois is worth fighting for, and that is why I'm here, and that's why I'm really vocal because it's a wonderful, beautiful place that I love, and would like to be able to stay. Um, I agree. My question is: Is what is your favorite? First part: What is your favorite thing about Illinois? And then the second part is, why is Illinois worth fighting for? Uh, when I was growing up, uh, uh, my family, my mom and dad, both grew up in a small town in Western Illinois, Amboy, in Lee County. 
Um, and we have a lot of family. We always joke we're related to half the town by blood or marriage um, because my mom was one of 11 kids. Um, and and I, we would go out there every summer and spend weekends out there. And we had a little cabin with uh, a pond and stuff. Il- Illinois is a beautiful state. And, and Illinois has awesome people. I, I lived in, in Texas. I've lived in Michigan and I lived in Washington, D.C. for college and around those years. And I, I came back to Illinois because it's got the greatest people in the, in, in the country. We're the most the most God fearing, loving, uh, uh, neighborly people um, that you could want as a neighbor. And um, I, I, I just you know, I used to love watching the Andy Griffith show with my dad when I was a kid. And what I loved about the Andy Griffith show is they were always out on the front porch waving to neighbors. And and then at some point we we started building fences in the backyard and having backyard and we lost that. And, but as a kid, I remember that. And that's what I love about Illinois. I've got eight brothers and sisters and their families that all came back to Illinois and Illinois is my home. And I will like you, I will fight for Illinois for the rest of my life. Um, I, 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 I mean, if I get old and I end up in Florida or Arizona or wherever and it's a snowbird because I can't take the winters anymore, that's one thing. But I, Illinois is my home. Amen. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add, share, encourage anyone with? Uh, I, I would just like to maybe uh, ask for no matter what happens in this election, I think it's important that we pray for the candidates. Because it's a huge sacrifice. It, it, it really is. I mean, we're really hard as Americans on candidates. And I was. I used to, uh, when other people were watching uh, sports, I would stay up and watch Fox News on election night until four in the morning. And my wife would uh, laugh at me. But that's how, kind of how I grew up. But it is a huge sacrifice. And I think that every one of our candidates needs, first and foremost, prayers. Because just support. Um, and, uh, in the bottom line is we're all Americans, we're all neighbors. And, uh, you know, Jesus said, you'll know my disciples by how you love one another. And, and that's what, that's what we need to get back to. And whether you're Christian, Jewish, uh, Muslim or whatever, it's all about loving our neighbors. And that's what this is about, because if we can show that example, to our children, guess what? We're, we're building a better America. Amen. I love that. I, I completely agree with that state sentiment as well. Um, thank you so much for joining. And remember, guys, on, we do pray for Illinois every Sunday. Do you know that? we gather. I did not know that, but uh, Blake told me, my campaign manager, so I will uh, I will uh, check in with you. Yeah, Sunday evenings, my husband comes on, and, and we pray for Illinois and take prayer requests live. Um, but I want to thank you so much for coming on, being the first from the 11th uh, Congressional District, because, I mean, they kind of got the one up now. They got to hear some of the questions. You're right. <laughs> uh, so you've got, you got a lot of people are saying thank you, good luck, um, and they appreciate your time for coming on. Uh, so we'll let you go. And uh, guys, I'm going to just let everyone else know, after this, I'm actually going live with someone else, uh, Savannah, <laughs> who is a young woman leading the fight, the pro-life fight. Um, And she partners with Right to Life and she's been incredible, guys. And so if you want, um, I'm going to join her live. You can hop on and follow that, ask some questions, help us become um, informed about what's really going on in Illinois. Illinois is becoming, um, at minimum, the abortion capital of the Midwest, if not the country. uh, Early with even legislation that passed the Illinois House this week. Um, So... Anyway, just want to let you guys know about that. And um, tomorrow night, I will be joined by uh, Catalina Lau, who you are running against. We will start that yep. at 8.30. Um, okay. So thank you again. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Bye, Mark. Bye.